Katie. How was your day? Good. We learned a lot of cool things about World War One. There's a ton of information I had never really heard about. That's great. I remember learning about the war when I was a kid. What did you discuss in class? Oh, I'll read you some of my notes. As the war started and went on, over time, there were many progressions, especially when it came to artillery. In the beginning, things were immobile and it created a lot of problems. Halfway through, tanks were introduced and mobility helped speed up things and move them along. By the end of the war, the way the battle was fought was almost completely different. So many improvements came along. I find World War I very interesting. I'm glad you're learning a lot and that you find it interesting. It's a great part of history to know about. Indeed. Night, Dad. See you in the morning. Zach from my history class? What are you doing here? Hey there, lady. I'm not Zach. I'm John French, commander in chief of the British Expeditionary Force of World War I. I learned about you at school today. I know all about you. Oh, really? What did you learn about me? I learned that you had strong faith in the Calvary, and you thought this would be a quick gentleman's war. Boy, were you wrong. It should have been, if it wasn't for German and their barbaric ways, using machine guns and barbed wire to take down my Calvary, my precious Calvary. But then, we had to do the same. In 1914, mobile warfare largely came to a standstill within several weeks and transformed into trench warfare. As a result, siege warfare became the norm. The importance of heavy artillery increased to the degree that field fortifications were driven deeper into the ground vertically and structured with greater complexity horizontally. Thousands of old siege guns from the 19th century still lacking recoil mechanisms made their way to the front lines. While their firing rate was low and maneuverability minimal, they could nevertheless shoot high caliber shells across great distances. Even though every effort was made to push ahead with a manufacture of modern recoil artillery, many of the old heavy guns remained in use through the end of the war and even after. When artillery was used, Germany used concentrated artillery fire to silence its enemy's guns to enable the infantry to proceed. And it was way superior to the French's doctrine, which advocated suppressing the enemy's infantry with field artillery fire to facilitate a decisive infantry attack. The machine gun was relatively scarce at this time, although the German practice of concentrating their fire rather than dispersing their guns added to their ability to control a killing zone between the armies known as No Man's Land. Every military operation in the First World War required massive artillery support if there was to be any hope of success. In mobile warfare, most soldiers were killed or wounded by infantry fire. By contrast, in trench warfare, the artillery was responsible for 75% of the known casualties. What are you doing in my room? I want to discuss World War I strategies with you. Okay, who are you? I am Douglas Haig. I took over John French's position. Now tell me, what have you learned about me? Well. After you took over for French, you protected the troops more by bombing the barbed wire and trenches. That's right. But it didn't work. Depends on who you talk to. Well, history states that bombing the trenches didn't do much. Well, one thing that went well was putting machine guns on planes. That worked well, too. Stopped those German bombers, and artillery did work. What do you mean it worked? We used a new strategy called the moving barrage. We fired while we attacked. Something that hadn't been done before. Faced with the stalemate on all fronts, rather than shattering the enemy's defenses, the elimination of his reserves became the class with the center of gravity of military operations. At the tactical level, the objective was the companies and battalions held ready to counterattack any offensive. At the operational level, it was the divisions and army corps kept in hand to reinforce threatened sectors. At the strategic level, the intention was to use up the undeployed manpower reserves which could sustain or swell an army's ranks year on year. Interestingly, warfare became a process of attrition, even as armies were evolving into modern, technologically sophisticated forces using tactics appropriate for an industrialized battlefield. The battles of 1915, although overambitious and largely ineffective,
are not sterile. The basic principles of combined arms warfare and the integration of technologies into tactical operational systems, which would allow an attacker a reasonable prospect of mastering defensive firepower, emerged from this trial. The well-armed infantry, able to operate with fire and movement tactics under the cover of protective artillery fire, made its appearance on the battlefield. Even if cooperation between arms, command, and control were rudimentary, because they still didn't want to use radios for some reason, they had to use runners. The gunners, increasingly the mainstay of the modern style of warfare, were developing appropriate techniques and munitions for their function as the infantry's protector. Airmen cultivated the role as the eyes of the advancing troops, along with the overlooked but very important tethered balloons, able to peer over hills and behind enemy lines. Systems to command the larger formations, multi-division army corps with attached formations and multi-corps armies, and to integrate supporting weapons were formulated to ma manage the growing complexity and extended duration of battle. All this was, however, hampered by a general shortage of weapons and munitions, which since battle was becoming more technical and material intensive, would be the principal constraint on successful offensive operations well into 1916. Oh my gosh, I need a glass of water. It's been a weird night. <laughs> what are you doing in my kitchen? Why are you eating my food? You don't know what it's like living in the trenches, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. 1916 brought on a whole new kind of strategy. So I've heard. We developed new shell shells for artillery called number 106 fuse. They would explode as soon as they touched to any type of barbed wire. We also developed shells that were compressed into poison gas, which would accurately deliver gas into enemy's positions. We would put our artillery on tanks, which made it much more mobilized. This introduced a new tactic, which was called the Creeping Barrage. Isn't that just like a moving barrage? No, not at all. We would fire in front of our trench line and then destroy everything in our path. The Germans couldn't find us or see us at all. Also, instead of aiming at the trenches, we would aim at the German guns and batteries, as well as clear the barbed wire. Creeping Barrage is an incredibly dangerous strategy, but much more effective than aiming at the trenches. Why would they do that? We learned that the trenches could withstand our ammunition, so destroying their guns allowed us to move without getting shot at. People can be replaced, but guns and weapons can't. We became experts at neutralizing or knocking out German guns almost as soon as it was open fire. Wow, that is a big change in strategy. 1916 is the most influential years of the World War I. During this time, the rear guns were putting into mi big metal casings called tanks. The first British tanks were very, very slow, and radiators were actually inside the weapons compartment, so the, so the radiator would often overheat and actually harm the inhabitants of the tank. Also, when they were first introduced, there was no really effective way to destroy them except aiming field guns at them that were very inaccurate. This will later bring up the need of anti-tank weapons, but that's only going to happen in World War II. Anyway, the tanks were used mainly as movable bunkers, pretty much, for infantry to stay behind and protect themselves from machine gun fire. It was also used to take down barbed wire so infantry could move along as well. This would have been a very successful tactic if the British had enough tanks, but they got very impatient and decided to just say screw it and throw a handful of tanks at the, at the German lines. And of course, when the Germans saw this new technology, they had to make their own tank as well. Which is why World War I was such a stalemate, because a new technology would come out, and they would, then they would do it. Lane's kind of the gas attacks of 1916 and 1915. 1915, the first gas attacks were rudimentary and kind of used wind. But the French did actually use gas-encased shells in 1915, but they were very inaccurate. In 1916, with the new fuses, they were allowed to be more accurate, and also detonate on contact. 1916 is also when the ba famous battles of Verdun and Somme happened, where rudimentary tactics were still being held. The plan still was to use a creeping barrage to support infantry up, up to the German line. Also at this time, they were still bombarding the German trenches, but throughout the year, they learned that taking out the guns were more effective. The logistics of indu industrialized battle imposed such constraints on the attack that had the defense collapsed, open warfare would have been difficult. The vast amount of munitions and men deployed for an offensive relied on complex railway networks for delivery and intricate staff work to get them there and to plan their use. 
armories were becoming vast, managerial bureaucracies sustained paperwork. The telephone, typewriter, and copying machines are the unrecognized weapons of modern warfare. Once set-piece battles had been planned, supplied, and engaged, operations took place at such a slow speed that defensive reserves could be deployed faster than assault troops could be get forwards, especially over shell-churned and often waterlogged ground and that resulted from such intensive battles. No, not until short-term neutralization replaced destruction as the, as the objective of a bombardment would the ground be left in such a state that troops and vehicles could make steady progress. Logistic networks had been strengthened, and the Somme Front had all but collapsed by September. A mixture of light railways to carry heavy munitions directly to gun positions and road trains and trucks, which increasingly replaced horse-drawn transport on the lines of communications, became the mainstay of offensive and defensive battles. The best known of these logistical systems, the mythologized Voyer Sacré road and railway corridor that sustained the French army during the Battle of Verdun, suggested that efficient supply to the battlefield was becoming as significant for its success as tactics. Over the course of the war, the ratio of teeth to tail formations and all armed forces shifted towards the latter as infantry support and logistics became the mainstay of modern technological armies. Dad, why are you awake so early? I'm not your dad. <gasps> I'm just another soldier and forced into this stupid war. I thought things were getting better. They don't care about us in the trenches. Trench life is still horrible. 1917 brought on new challenges. But because we are British, we obviously developed a new strategy to overcome anything the Germans threw at us. Like what? Well, instead of just aiming at the German guns and batteries, we chose to isolate those poor suckers, cutting off all their routes of transport, preventing the enemy command from sending reinforcements. This strategy was called the Box Barrage. It was a war-winning strategy. Wow, that seems kind of harsh. Well, it was a harsh war, and harsh strategy was necessary. Mobility was also key. Tanks and aircraft allowed us to move around a lot easier. Insult! No, I'm not John French. I'm just an ordinary soldier that was forgotten in history. Let me guess. You are from 1918. Correct! How did you know? It's been a long night. You know what? Let's cut the chit chat. I'm here to talk about one of the final artillery advancements that was so important to the war, and it's called a predictive fire. Yeah. Finally, this is almost over. Don't give me a lip. This was very important. Just as important as the consistency of manufacturing our artillery shells to be almost the same. This allowed our shells to be even more accurately and consistently fired at, just at targets from distance. Which allowed us to have predictive fire. Predictive fire is very important to winning this war. It allowed us to be increasingly mobile as well. Oh wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. I had the worst kind of sleep last night and the weirdest dream at that. Dad, you were in it, Zach from history class is in it, and a bunch of random soldiers from World War I. Tell me more about it. Well, to summarize my dream, artillery and machine guns changed the strategy of World War I dramatically. Throughout the years, the progression of mobility in our machine guns and artillery allowed infantry to capture enemy lines and territory. Thanks to the progression of machine guns and artillery, the British won World War I. That's nice. Now, how do you like your wheat when it's done? Extra crispy. Ready? Yeah. 1917 and 1918, the Allies came up with a tactic called the bite and hold. Which basically what they would do is they would they would pick a section of trench and they would only attack that section and that objective and take it using combined armor, air support and artillery support. And what they would do is that they would take this and form a tiny little bulge in the front line and they would send up more munitions and more people to hold that part so that as they're taking little bits of front line, they will hold it and defend it. Which is why in World War II, weapons became extremely mobile. If there was mortars and machine guns that could be easily taken into front lines without really that much of a delay, then you could easily set up a position really quick. Which is why tanks became faster and also had anti-tank guns. So that the ta tanks could bust through their tanks 
and then set up defensive positions to take out and form this little bulge. And then we do it all across the whole front line. And World War II we did that extremely well. Except when in the beginning, when they actually used the surprise to their advantage, which was the Germans obviously, they blitzkrieged. They would do all three of them at the same time. They would air force first and destroy everything that would pose a threat to the armor. And then the armor would roll through and then pick up the scraps and the infantry would just destroy everything on the way there and also set up with defensive positions the thing is is that keep the mobility is key because you can break through a line but if you can't get your stuff if you can't get the supplies to the front line of which the new front line you created there is just no possible way to actually like there's no possible way to hold that front which is how world war one invented the modern style of warfare Thank you for watching from the group Volgograd.